Okay. Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, say this. After his suffering, he, that is Jesus, showed himself to those men, that is the apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, since January, we have been going through a series in Acts chapter 2 to 11, effectively preaching through our vision, which of course has a strap line, impacting and influencing Inverness, the Highlands, and the world. And during that series, we have been speaking about what it means to live an ordinary, spirit-filled life. It's a life where the ordinary days become extraordinary. It's a day, it's a, it's a life where signs and wonders point to the reality of the risen Jesus. It's a life that sees many people come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's a life that attracts opposition because it stands out from the crowd. But it is a life that is worth it because salvation in Jesus is worth it because of who he is and what he's done and the hope that he has called us to. And as we have worked our way through Acts chapter 2 to 11, we have seen the absolute necessity of being filled with the Holy Spirit and the outflow, the overflow of that in our lives to come to understand the complete necessity that without him we can do nothing. And if we want to see our vision for him fulfilled, if we want to see that large, healthy, multiplying church in which God is doing something in the city which cannot be ignored by those in the city, if we want to see those rivers of people being baptized, those rivers of people being set free, if we want to see the vision for him fulfilled, then it will not be by power, it will not be by might, but it will be by his spirits. And I know we're not there yet, but we have the eyes of faith to see that we want to pursue all that he has planned for us. Because during our series, we've also come to realize that the Lord wants to involve us in what he is doing. And we need to be working in partnership with the Holy Spirit. We need to be listening to him. We need to have boldness to exercise faith and trust and obedience to what Jesus is asking us to do, irrespective of the circumstance, because our ultimate desire has to be to please him and not ourselves, to glorify him and not man. Oh Lord, fill us afresh with your Spirit. We pray for the boldness so that we can be who you might call you call us to be in terms of impacting and influencing Inverness the Highlands and the world. And as we were working through our series in Acts 2 to 11, the Lord was already speaking to me and beginning to work in my spirit about what we should be speaking about after the summer period. And I was drawn to Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, the passage that is on the screen behind. After the resurrection of Jesus... And before the ascension of Jesus, Jesus spent 40 days speaking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. So before the Holy Spirit came, these disciples were immersed in now understanding the principles of the kingdom of God from the risen Christ, because you remember it says in scripture that the disciples didn't really understand these things until after Jesus was resurrected. So now for 40 days from the risen Christ, the penny drops. They understand the principles of the kingdom of God. 
And then when the Holy Spirit fell, they lived in the power of the Spirit. So today as we begin this series of Kingdom Living, living, in which we're going to take a look at what the Bible says concerning the Kingdom of God. Especially what Jesus said concerning the Kingdom of God. And my prayer is that as we work through these scriptures that teach us about the Kingdom of God, we might know afresh from the risen Jesus what it means to live under the reign and rule of the King, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this morning we're going to begin this series by looking at the heart of the kingdom. What is the central message of the kingdom of God? What does all the teaching about the kingdom of God have at its core? So we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 4 and verses 12 through 17. And I'm just going to read this short passage. Matthew chapter 4 verses 12 to 17. And it says this. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Amen, and may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. The whole of Jesus' teaching ministry centers on these words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Or as the Gospel of Mark says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So what is the kingdom of God? All around us we hear talk of the kingdom. People talk about kingdom values, kingdom lifestyles. We talk about not specifically growing a church, but growing the kingdom. And admittedly, kingdom is a difficult concept for us to maybe understand today. Although we live in the United Kingdom, the concept of a kingdom becomes less and less aligned to the monarch, even if you take her own queen. She reigns on the throne of the United Kingdom, but she does not rule. The government does that. And we're most likely to associate a kingdom with a territory. So, for example, the kingdom of Fife. Or the United Kingdom. It's a territory. It's a realm. We don't necessarily associate the kingdom with the person who sits on the throne as a monarch. But in ancient times... In the ancient world, a kingdom was inseparable from the king. So when we talk about God's kingdom, or the kingdom of God, then the kingdom of God is not a place, or a, a, or a, it's not a territory, it's not a realm. It's the kingship of God. God's kingdom is his kingship. Where God is king, there is his kingdom. The kingdom is inseparable from the king. Now, it would be easy for us to equate God's kingdom with his rule and his reign. Yes, he rules and reigns as Lord a sovereign Lord over all things, sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. As Psalm 103 verse 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Yet when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God, he doesn't seem to be referring to his sovereign rule over everything 
He says that the kingdom is near. As he says in Matthew 4, verse 17, the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus says the kingdom can be entered into. Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. It can be prayed to come. As Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, verse 10, Your kingdom come. It can be sought. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. It can be inherited. Matthew 25, verse 34. Jesus says, Then then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So by thinking in terms of kingship, it will help us to see that his, the kingdom is more tightly tied to the person rather than to a, a, an area or a sphere of authority. The kingdom is not an obvious concept. So to understand the kingdom, we need to find out what Jesus himself shows us what the kingdom is through the scriptures, rather than trying to rely on maybe our preconceived ideas of what we think the kingdom is. So when we turn in the series to the gospel, because there Jesus says something quite remarkable. He says that some of them will see the kingdom of God. Luke 9 verse 27, just a few verses after Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. The kingdom, Jesus says, is something that can be seen, and that was seen by some of his disciples. The answer comes in the verses that immediately follow that passage, Christ's transfiguration. In the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John saw the glory and the majesty of Christ. They saw his kingship. They saw his kingdom. For they saw with their very own eyes that they were indeed in the presence of the king. In Christ's transfiguration, Peter, James, and John saw the kingdom of God. And so for for, for Christ, through Christ's transfiguration, we can see what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is the glory and majesty and brightness of Christ. It's the brightness of the king. The kingdom of God is the kingship of Christ. The glory of the king, which is his kingdom. It's a Trinitarian glory. As Martin Luther said, the whole Holy Trinity appears here to strengthen the believers, namely Christ in his transfigured form, the Father in the voice, and the Holy Ghost in the bright cloud. So to see the kingdom of God is to see the glory and majesty of the triune God in beholding Christ our King. As it says in Colossians 2, 9, for in him All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. That's why the kingdom of God can be near or at hand. That's why the kingdom of God can also be within us. It can be not yet. It can be already here. The kingdom can be at hand because the display of the glorious majesty of Christ's kingship is at hand. He's coming on the clouds and every knee before him is going to bow. It can be already here because the king in all his majesty and glory dwells within us through the Holy Spirit. We can enter the kingdom not by showing our passport to get into another country, but by being united with Christ the King. The kingdom of God is within us because Christ the King rules and reigns in our lives and we abide in him. And by seeing that the kingdom is the kingship of the King, 
We see that to pray things like, your kingdom come, is much more weightier request than merely for social justice or for godly laws or to see people healed. For to pray your kingdom come is to pray that we would behold the kingship of Christ. That we would see the brightness and the majesty and his glory. That includes both our salvation and his return. It includes the triumph of his light over the darkness in hearts and lives. It includes the glory of his coming with the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead. It includes, as 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. Christ calls us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if the kingdom is the Christ kingship, then to seek first the kingdom of God is to seek first Christ the king. Amen. Our hearts are to be set on Christ and his righteousness. For Christ himself is the only kingdom in which, as Romans 14, 17 says, where righteousness, peace, peace, Joy in the Holy Ghost will ever truly be found. So when Jesus says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. He's declaring that Christ, the King, has come. That's why it's good news. There is now a light to those who have been living in darkness. There is now a light dawned on those living in the shadow of death. Because the king has come. Hallelujah. Jesus says in Luke 19 verse 10, in the account of Zacchaeus the tax collector, Jesus declares why the king has come. For the Son of Man came came to seek and to save that which was lost. As Jesus explained to Nicodemus, The only way to enter the kingdom of heaven must be that we must be born again. And the way to be born again is to come to the king, to come to Jesus. For he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. The king has come. This is good news. You see, in the coming of the king, Jesus is, is, is announcing the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Promises that the reign of God has arrived, as he, Jesus said when he took up the scroll in the synagogue in Nazareth, when he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the rule of the king. This is what the king came to do. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. And in Jesus' coming, outcasts are being gathered as predicted, as Jesus says in Mark 2 verse 17, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In Jesus' coming, Satan has been defeated. In John 14, verse 30, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, the week running up to his crucifixion, and he says this, I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. Praise him. You see, the king reigns, and the king has come, and his kingdom is over every realm, and over every principality and power, for the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. You see, the prince of this world, as Jesus calls him, is Satan, and his realm is the earth, and his culture, and his economy is sin. And it reigns in the lives of people that dwell within his realm. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were all destined for Satan's doom in the lake of fire where there is weeping and there is gnashing of teeth. But the king came. Christ the king came. And he reigns. Overall, 
The king came to defeat the power of sin in people's lives. He became sin for them. He died on the cross, defeating sin. He rose from the grave, defeating death. So that through belief in him, people can be transformed from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of God. It is good news. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The king has come. It is good news. The only way to enter the kingdom is through Christ the king. Jesus invites people to turn away from the dominion of darkness. Turn away from the culture of sin. Turn away from the father of lies and turn to the truth. Turn to the king. Where there is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Turn away from that which destroys God, turn and come and put yourself under the rule and the reign of the king because his, the king has come and his kingdom has come. It's a kingdom of life. It's a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom of joy. It's a kingdom of peace. It's a kingdom of wholeness. It's a kingdom of righteousness. It's a kingdom of justice. It's a kingdom of wisdom because the kingdom is irreparable from the king because the king is life. The king is love. The king is joy. The king is peace. The king is perfection. The king is righteous. The king is wisdom. So then is his kingdom. And we can enter that kingdom through the king. So to bring this to a conclusion, the heart of the kingdom is the heart of the king. 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is the heart of the kingdom. This is the heart of the king. This is the central message. Of the kingdom of God. This is where all the teaching about the kingdom of God has at its core. Come to the king. Believe in the king. Enter the kingdom. Maybe this morning you've not come into the kingdom of God. You've not come to the king to seek entry. Maybe this morning you want to be transformed from the dominion of darkness. Maybe this morning you want to come into the kingdom of the Son. You want to come to Christ the King. To turn away from the reign of sin in your life. That is destroying your life. And leaving you down, leading you down a road that ends in destruction. Then I ask you to come to the King in simple faith. Believing that Jesus the King came to die for your sin. To pay the price for your sin. And he did that completely, once for all. But he rose from the dead so that we can know life, his life, resurrected life, eternal life. And by repenting, turning around from going in the direction that you're going and turning towards the king and to the king, you can enter the kingdom of God by believing and asking Jesus to be your king. So in and through Jesus, God the King comes in a new way into the world to establish his saving rule. First in the hearts of people, in the relationship with God, through the triumphing over sin, Satan and death. Then by the exercise of his reign, he gathers a people for himself that live as aliens and strangers in this world, for they are no longer citizens of this realm where the prince of this world reigns, but they are now citizens of the king. 
They are now in his kingdom. They are now children of the king. And then thirdly, Christ will come a second time and complete the reign by establishing his kingdom rule on earth, followed by a new heaven and a new earth. Glory to his name. Because the kingdom of God, the rule of the king, is both now and not yet. 1 John 3 8 summarizes like this. Dear friends, now we are children of God because we've entered the kingdom. Now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. For the kingdom is synonymous with the king. You cannot separate the kingdom from the king. You just can't. And if we've entered the kingdom, then we have accepted the rule and reign of the king in our lives. The king has come to dwell in us through the Holy Spirit. So the heart of the king has come to dwell in us. And I wonder, is that our heart this morning? Are we calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near? Are we telling people that the king has come not to condemn the world, but to save the world? Do they know that they can be free from the reign of sin, the reign and the rule of sin, and be forgiven because the king has come with his rule of life, love, and godliness? Do they know that the year of the Lord's favor has come and that he is patient with them, not desiring that any of them perish, but all of them come and enter the kingdom of God? Do they know that? Do they know that that kingdom is love, is life, is joy, is peace, is righteousness, not through anything that they have done, but because of what the king has done for them? Do they know that? Oh, may the heart of the kingdom be the heart of us who are in his kingdom. For when we seek first the kingdom, we seek first the king. And when we seek the king, we seek his heart, and his heart becomes our heart. For the king reigns and rules in us. And I feel this morning we need to have some kind of response. The king has come. The heart of the king is for people to enter his kingdom. And there may be some here that are not yet part of his kingdom. They've not entered the kingdom. They've not come to the king. There's maybe some here who feel they've got one foot in the kingdom and one foot out of the kingdom. There's maybe some here who have lost the passion, the heart of the king. They've lost the passion for those who are living in darkness. There's maybe some here who are not giving their whole heart to the king and his kingdom. And I'm in one of those camps. So the Lord speaks and challenges me. Just like he speaks and challenges you. But the king has come. So what is your response? What is my response? God knows your heart. I'm just going to give a few moments silence while the music still plays to give you time to reflect before we respond to the king. has come. What is our response to the king? 